On this Friday night, critical compensation for Indigenous Canadians. Two class action lawsuits over unsafe water settled. When the water touches her, her feet, she's filled with pain. The agreement worth billions. The worsening fears a fourth wave is on the way. Plus, mounting questions about needing a third vaccine dose. The rise in Taliban takeovers and targets. They're just killing people. The race to help Afghan interpreters in danger. And batter up, the boys of summer are back. We're happy that we're able to come home. After striking out for nearly two years, Major League Baseball returns to Canada. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Nitu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with an historic settlement on something that most Canadians take for granted, but that so many Indigenous Canadians in this country don't have access to clean drinking water. The federal government is committing nearly $8 billion to settle two class action lawsuits from First Nations over unsafe drinking water. There are communities that have been without safe water for decades and the toll is immense. Growing up, avoiding tap water was the way of life. Don't put your toothbrush in it. Don't rinse your mouth. Make sure you have enough bottled water to get through the long weekend and people would get sick from the water. I got sick and my family got sick. Nishkanaga First Nation has been with this water crisis for close to three decades, closing in on 27 years. We often wonder in our community why it has taken so long to provide something for our First Nation. I, I could sit here and try and give you all the excuses in the world, but there is no credible excuse for countries such as Canada to take this long. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller laid out the agreement in principle with leaders from three of the plaintiff communities, Nishkanaga First Nation, Curve Lake First Nation, and Tatasquia Cree Nation. The settlement must still be approved by the courts, but is said to modernize Canada's First Nations drinking water legislation and offer $1.5 billion in compensation to those deprived of clean drinking water. About 142,000 people from 258 First Nations are expected to receive compensation, and that number could rise. The proposed settlement includes a commitment of at least $6 billion over the next decade to provide reliable access to that safe water, including creating a First Nations advisory committee, supporting First Nations in developing their own water initiatives, and making Ottawa responsible for private water systems such as wells. Right now, there are at least 51 long-term drinking water advisories in 32 First Nations. And to the pandemic, Canada's top health officials are warning we could see a fourth wave of COVID-19 by the end of the summer. With just five weeks until the Labor Day long weekend, the highly contagious Delta variant is already fueling it. Since July 18th, Canada's R number is trending above one and rising. That means one infected person will spread it to more than one other, signaling early signs of epidemic growth. 66% of the population is now fully vaccinated, but Canada's top doctor wants that number to be above 80% across all age groups before we begin to gather indoors again this fall. While Canada still has a ways to go to hit that target, Alberta is pushing ahead with its plan to end its pandemic response. And as Heather Urex West reports, there are fears the policy shift could put people in other provinces at risk. Last spring, Tannis McConnell lived through a parent's worst nightmare. Her seven-year-old son, Hunter, spent several days in intensive care. It was terrifying. He's hooked up to so many things. And I think the second day he was there, they came in and started oxygen. Uh, so we knew things were were really bad. Hunter was diagnosed with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, or MIS-C, a condition that occurs in kids several weeks after they've contracted COVID-19. McConnell worries Alberta's decision to end its pandemic response plan, a move that would mean less testing and contact tracing, and no longer require COVID positive cases to quarantine, will put more children at risk. 
in Calgary and Edmonton Friday, several hundred people gathered to protest. Canada's chief public health officer expressed concern as well. If uh, the policy in Alberta is is not to mandate that, then I would ask that any individual who is diagnosed with COVID-19 or you think you may have it, um, please isolate. Alberta is far from finished with COVID-19. Modeling out of the University of Victoria shows that cases are currently rising much faster than they did in the previous waves. At this pace, cases could reach the height of the spring wave by September. The projections also show hospital and ICU numbers rising towards the end of summer. Unless there's something that's going to mediate that, uh, it's going to be uh, a large outbreak, call it a fourth wave, um, uh, through the unvaccinated population and because of you know the incomplete efficacy of the vaccine through some of the vaccinated population. Creating a potentially dangerous situation just as kids still ineligible for vaccine head back to school this fall. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The fourth wave concerns are being fueled by the rapid spread of the Delta variant. New modeling released by the Public Health Agency of Canada shows the variant is the most transmissible to date and has an increased risk for hospitalization. Internal documents out of the U.S. are also sounding the alarm about the Delta variant. They show it can cause more severe illness than earlier variants and spreads as easily as chickenpox. The data has many wondering whether there is a need to start thinking about booster shots. Today, Israel announced it would offer a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to people over 60, the first country to do so. President Isaac Herzog was the first to roll up his sleeves. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also received a third dose. So far, there is little science to back up the need for a booster yet. But as Mike LeCouture reports, Canada's health leaders say they're watching the evolving data closely. Why are there 6.3 million uh, you know, Canadians uh, who are eligible uh, to get a uh, vaccine, haven't even received their first dose? You know, what are you waiting for? Before offering booster shots, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer of Canada wants to reach residents of this country who are still reticent about vaccines. If they needed proof of protection, public health officials provided these stats. Less than 1% of fully vaccinated people have been hospitalized because of COVID-19. And just half a percent even got the disease after getting full protection. I think people should be very um, heartened by the fact that the breakthrough infections are very few. Israel has announced it will start offering a third shot or booster of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to people over the age of 60, based on some data suggesting a decline in immunity over time. Canada's top doctor says officials are looking at the evolving data. We're getting operationally ready, whether it is looking at supplies, whether it is looking at the uh, implementation side. Now, Pfizer suggests its third dose is effective against the more deadly Delta variant beyond the protection offered by the standard two doses. But some virologists caution the company's claim could lack the full context. We're, we're seeing a lot of data or a lot of updates in regards to science that, that is being released to the public through press release rather than through, uh, through actual scientific literature. Before some countries get a third, poorer nations are still struggling to get first doses. The World Health Organization believes 70% vaccine coverage globally will slow transmission. And we're not there yet. The highest priority has got to be helping all countries get to at least 10% of their population vaccinated, 20%, 40%. Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland said Canada has a moral responsibility to help get vaccines to the rest of the world. But she added the government will follow the advice of our medical officials when it comes to a potential booster shot. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Today, Finance Minister Christian Freeland announced the extension of COVID-19 emergency benefits until late October. But with a looming fourth wave, there is concern non-essential workers may not be able to cope with another wave of job losses. Anne Gaviola reports. Calgary resident Nicole Menzies has turned to CERB and EI three times, once during each wave of shutdowns. I've always 
been very much in control of my finances and my living situation. And to all of a sudden be so unsure of that, particularly in a pandemic when people are too terrified to go outside, like it was just so scary. The mother of two says her finances were stretched before COVID and the aid was a lifeline for her family. I'm really grateful. It, it, saved, it saved my mental health, it, it saved my home, and it put food in our cupboards. With COVID case counts climbing in Alberta, there's growing concern about the impact of a potential fourth wave, which economists say could hit just as current supports from the federal government come to an end in early fall. The governments may decide to keep a couple of the other kinds of restrictions in place uh, with respect to uh, capacity limits in retail settings, for example. Uh, so those sort of things could carry on a little further than uh, perhaps otherwise expected. When asked about extending emergency aid for workers, the federal employment minister's office said in a statement to Global News, we've had Canadians back since the beginning of the pandemic and we will continue to be there for them. Labour experts say even if a fourth wave doesn't result in further shutdowns and job losses, it is likely to hamper earnings. You can't force people to go out. Uh, and so if there is a general fear uh, of catching COVID-19, of going to a hospital, there's certainly likely to be some psychological impact and therefore some financial impact for those frontline businesses. Analysts say government officials need to move from a reactive policy approach to a strategy for managing COVID over the longer term, from a passport system to a vaccine program that involves booster shots. Policy in general has been created around the expectation that eventually the pandemic will end and will return to a state of normal. Uh, but we may not actually see that. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Japan is expanding its state of emergency after reporting a record spike in infections. The order now includes four more areas in addition to Tokyo. Emergency measures will remain in place until the end of August, after the Olympics and well into the Paralympics. Tokyo reported record increases in COVID-19 cases for three days in a row before logging more than 3,000 today. Officials say the surge is being fueled by the Delta variant. Canada added another medal to the collection in Tokyo. It is the country's 11th of the game so far. The gold captured by the women's eight rowing crew, the country's second rowing medal in as many days. Swimmer Penny Alexiak didn't medal during her 100-meter freestyle event, but she still delivered a Canadian record-setting performance. Crystal Gamansing has more. They call it the Coxwin Toss. It's a winner's ritual to dunk the team member who steered the crew to victory, a tradition the Canadian women have been waiting a generation to take part in. When we crossed the finish line and it really happened, our dream came true. Just, and right now we just get to uh, celebrate it and um, be really proud of ourselves and really embrace this once-in-a-lifetime moment. The last time Canada won gold for women's eight-crew rowing event was in 1992, Madison Maley wasn't even born yet. Felt like, uh, yeah, fairy tale ending almost to this crazy past, especially two years, I guess. It's a feeling the women's soccer team can likely relate to. They'll get a shot at a third consecutive Olympic medal after defeating Brazil. The game came down to a nail biting round of penalty kicks. Canada now turns its attention to the semi final match Monday against the U.S. Swimmer Penny Oleksiak hit the water with her usual intensity, but it didn't result in a medal. She did, however, swim the 100-meter freestyle faster than she ever has and broke a Canadian record. Penny is inspiring you know, young women to, to see that, that, that things that they feel passionate about, which could be sports or it could be arts, or it could be you know whatever it is. Um, I mean, that is a woman and as a mother, I mean, again, that's that's inspiring to me. There will be more inspiring moments as the games move into the second week of competition. Athletics gets underway, and that means we'll see favorites such as sprinter Andre de Grasse. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Canada's 11 medals puts us in 11th place in the overall standings. China is at the top with the most gold, 19 so far. And the U.S. has the most medals overall with 41. It's the intense burden of trying to be the world's best. Coming up, the mental health disorders top athletes are at risk of developing. Plus, Houston, we have a problem. How the International Space Station got knocked off course.
When Olympic gymnast Simone Biles walked away from the final this week, she put mental health at center stage. Now a study, the first of its kind in Canada, has found our elite athletes are at greater risk of a mental health disorder than the general public. And as Global News health reporter Jamie Marocker found out, asking for help isn't as simple as it sounds. Preparing for the Tokyo Olympics in 2019, Canadian softball player Larissa Franklin says she could feel something was wrong. I just had this mindset every single day of like I didn't do enough. Anxious about her performance, the now 28-year-old says she was facing burnout. A study out of the University of Toronto found 41% of our elite athletes meet criteria for one or more mental disorders, including depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. I was quite surprised by it because that number is quite high. Um, but maybe I shouldn't have been because that's also quite reflective of research from elite athletes in other countries. UK researchers found 48% of athletes surveyed experienced similar symptoms. And in Australia, the number is even higher at 50%. There's this really important dedication to the sport that sort of creates the potential for stress. Canadian athletes cited stress and training load as main factors impacting their mental health. Decorated swimmer Mark Tewksbury highlighted post-Olympic depression in the 90s and says there is support now. Athletes have access to, to mental health professionals 24-7 um, on, on a telephone line. They have access to uh, appointments whenever they need them. All the teams have a psychologist traveling with them and Team Canada has a chief medical officer and a chief psychologist that's over there in Tokyo right now. But for Franklin, seeking help meant risking her dreams. I felt like if it got back to the coach, then then he was going to assume that I wasn't ready to step up to the plate um, and perform. On Canada's softball team, Franklin says there are monthly meetings with a psychologist, a proactive approach, experts say, and a start to changing the mental health stigma that still exists in the world of sports. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Ahead, a comic killed by the Taliban stokes fears that Canada has failed Afghans who helped our troops. The first group of Afghans who worked for American troops and face retaliation from the Taliban has arrived in the U.S. Overnight, about 200 landed in Washington and were bused to a military base in Virginia for medical screening. While the U.S. program has begun its evacuation flights, the Canadian program announced last week is still only taking applications. As Mike Armstrong explains, the murder this week of an Afghan comedian is a brutal example of what interpreters and other Afghans who worked with Canadian troops could face if they're not rescued. And a warning, some of the images in this story may be disturbing. <laughs> if you had searched for his name online a week ago, you would have found laughter. <laughs> he was known as Khasha Swan, a comedian in Kandahar who posted videos on social media. If you search for his name now, the video that comes up first is of his recent arrest by Taliban gunmen just before he was killed. <laughs> Wali Nouri was an Afghan interpreter who worked with Canadian troops. He now lives in Vancouver. I got a, bit, a little bit emotional, so sorry. Nouri says Hashizwan's killing at the hands of the Taliban shows their brutality and how Afghanistan is growing more and more dangerous, even for a comedian. He's a very funny guy. His only aim in life was just to make people, uh, people uh, laugh. That's it. <laughs> Khasha Zwan was shot several times. The Taliban has taken responsibility. A spokesperson claims the comedian worked with police and should have been taken in front of a Taliban court. That didn't happen. Khasha. Now, there are reports in recent weeks of hundreds of similar revenge killings. The Taliban taking over parts of the country and going after people who worked with the Afghan government or NATO troops. We reached one of the interpreters who worked with Canadian troops who's in hiding. He's applied to move to Canada with his family. We're protecting his identity. He was just like a joker, you know? He says the killing of the comedian is what awaits anyone who worked with Canadian troops if they don't get out of Afghanistan and the Taliban takes over. They're doing the same thing like they used to be. They, they're just, they're just killing people. 
Now, there has been criticism of Ottawa's plan to rescue Afghans, that it started late and was then slow to ramp up. Many of them are in danger. The federal government Friday admitted complications, but says it's doing its due diligence vetting applicants and recognizes the urgency. Mike Armstrong, Global News. It's been nearly two years too long. Next, Toronto welcomes the Blue Jays home. Talk about an out-of-this-world oops. The International Space Station was briefly knocked out of its position in orbit on Thursday after a new Russian science lab accidentally fired off its thrusters. The lab, which docked just hours before, caused the station to lose control for nearly an hour. Russian officials say a software glitch was to blame. The station is now back into position. Well, after nearly two years away due to the pandemic, baseball has returned to Toronto. The Blue Jays are back home at Rogers Centre tonight for their game against Kansas City, and thousands of fans there will get to see their long-awaited return. Eric Sorensen joins us from there tonight, and Eric, this isn't just any other sports comeback. Me too. In this pandemic era, no Major League Baseball team has waited longer to play home games at home. 670 days since September 2019. The itinerant Toronto Blue Jays are finally in Toronto. There is anticipation and excitement that has been absent from the cavernous Rogers Centre for almost two years. We are waiting for more than 161 games, I think, so this is the night. Pandemic restrictions forced the team to play home games in Buffalo, just across the border, and in Dunedin, Florida. Now the team has spruced up the stadium and made it ready for the team and its fans to return for games in person in Canada. We're making this a big deal. We're happy that we're able to come home. There will be COVID protocols in place. Just 15,000 fans allowed in, about a quarter of capacity. The roof will be open for all games. Even on rain days, there will be some open circulation. Fans will have to wear masks, except when eating, and most will be seated next to other fans. I think that's that little bit of normal that everyone's been looking for, to be able to sit by your neighbour and, and celebrate the Blue Jays and celebrate your team. Even with 15,000 fans, the risk from the highly transmissible Delta variant is believed to be small, for now anyway. I think that right now is a good time as any in the summertime. The situation's changed. Vaccines have allowed us to have these events now, and we can do so safely. The risk is not zero, but it's much better than it was uh, even a couple months ago. Then there is the team itself on the cusp of being a postseason contender, featuring a big hitting lineup of young stars, led by one of the most talented, charismatic players in the game today, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. The return should enhance sponsorship, fan support, and even the team's performance on the field. With this kind of latent pent up demand, it will hopefully explode in the form of uh, great passion at the games, which can hopefully lift the team to some wins. The team even acquired a big-name pitcher, Jose Barrios, from Minnesota at today's trade deadline, making the team even more competitive this season. Eric Sorensen, Global News. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Neetu Garcha. We'll leave you tonight with some of Toronto's landmarks lit up in white and blue for its baseball team. Niagara Falls is putting on a bright show for the Blue Jays, too. Let's play ball. Thanks for watching. Eric Sorensen will be at the Anchor Desk tomorrow. Have a good night.